in uh, RAD, although most of the action, if not every bit of it, is done by the greatest stunt doubles in the world. So that's my intro. It's a great intro. Bart? I'm Bart Connor, uh, Olympic gymnastics champion, and uh, Bart Taylor in RAD. So they wrote the script with a guy named Bart in it, so that apparently they had to call me because, you know, it just wasn't easy. And uh, it's, it's been amazing to me all these years later how this movie still resonates with people. A day or a week doesn't go by where somebody doesn't mention something about Rad to me. And it just blows my mind. So it's fun that it still has legs and people care about it. And uh, I get a thrill, I gotta say. Amazing. Um, I'm Robert Schwartzman. And uh, personally, my, my life has been uh, in the music industry with a band called Rooney and uh, started directing and producing feature films and uh, started eventually a company called Utopia. And Utopia um, is the company behind re-releasing Rad. And uh, the other connect to Rad is my dad, Jack Schwartzman, produced the movie. And my mom, Talia Shire, is uh, in the film and plays Crew's mother. I, I got roped into this because I am a giant Rad fan from Amazing. my childhood. Uh, it, uh, what year did it come out exactly? 1986. 86. 86, I was 12 years old. I was riding my GT BMX bike, racing, freestyle, all of it. I was so deep into that world. So it's really, this is a thrill for me to, to meet and chat with you guys. Movie, it, it's funny, when it came out, it was it, very mixed reviews. It was not a box office smash by any stretch. Um, but like a lot of cult films, it's just sort of held on uh, to its core fan base. What is it that is so special about this movie? What is it that speaks to, to its fans? I can answer that uh, by bringing Hal Needham into the conversation. He directed Rad. I believe he came up with the concept of Hell Track. Hal was a big NASCAR guy. And he helped bring showbiz and glitz to NASCAR. And he saw the same opportunity with bicycles. So that's why he had the hot girls in the stands and this big overblown race at the end. He was a very, you know, kind of popcorn movie uh, making director. And he knew how to make race movies that kept you on the edge of your seat. And he just turned his vision towards BMX and how lucky for us that he did that because I do not think it would have had the same structure or impact had Hal not stepped up to the plate. So we're very lucky to have him. Bart, any insight into what's uh, what connects to people in this movie? You know, I haven't been able to figure that out, but I, it, it resonates for so many years. And I think probably it was really geared towards that teenage boy who was just experiencing some freedom. They got a bike. They were trying to do some tricks in their backyard or in the park or whatever. And, and all of a sudden they saw this movie with this outrageous level of, you know, hell track stunts and, and really cool freestyle. And it was also a movie about young boys coming of age and fighting back against a corporate system that had full of greed and, and I think there was, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, you said you loved the movie, Ed. I mean, what, what was it about that connected you at that age? Because I'm finding a lot of people these days who are between about 40 and 50. I mean, they, they rented it like once a week from Blockbuster. Yeah. Well, I just it, it, I was just right in the Target demo, right? I, I was obsessed with BMX and reading all the magazines all the time. I knew all the... Uh, all the guys that were your stunt doubles and and that were also that raced in the in the final hell track scene and uh like literally po their posters were in my bedroom and uh and i think it, it was like finally something it, it to me like bmx was always a little bit punk rock it was like kind of counterculture um so it wasn't something that was seen out in in popular culture so much but when a movie like this came out and just was like, I was just telling someone earlier today, they were asking me what I'm doing later. I was like, oh, I'm doing this rad uh, panel. And, and I was explaining how like, when that movie came out, I felt seen. <laughs> like I felt, I felt sort of like heard and understood for somehow for the first time. 
Um, and uh, yeah, because because BMX was very much frowned upon as like a you know you know the the punk kids like wh where I grew up in Atlanta. Um, I mean, it had certainly a big like the the little league racing aspect of it was very kind of institutionalized, and I was very into that too. But the kind of more street freestyle stuff was all kind of kind of like skateboarding, you know. At the same time, it was just very renegade feeling, um, and and so it just this it so it just stuck with me. It, it latched onto me at exactly the right time, Bart. And so it's always been something I I just remember so fondly. Uh, Robert's movie I, was made very young, right? Yeah, because I was I was born at the very like the last few days of 1982, so I'm sort of, sort of beginning of 83. But it was okay, 85. I mean, I my mom recently showed me video of uh, some pictures of me at a rad parade when I was maybe like four years old, or sitting on like the back of a car at a rad parade. But um, she was showing me that because you know it's. My, so I'll add, you know, just to give you the history, but like my dad passed away when we were very young and rad was like something he left behind for us, you know, so mm. for a, for our family, it's been like learning. It's almost like learning his life through the things he left behind these the pieces of his life. Mm. So I, I don't have like maybe in my brain somewhere I can find tap into like a rad visual of being that at that time, but sure. But so, and that's why this phase of like utopia and rad and all these things is like, has a sort of other emotional connection for us. Yeah. But um, I mean, no, I was really young, the sort of for everybody on the, you know, for Bill and Bart, like they can go back in their mind and really visualize being on set every day and getting a call sheet and talking to Hal about how he's gonna approach a certain stunt. And so they, they, they were living and breathing this movie on another level. I just I look at it through a different lens and it totally objectively is just a, a family member who was just sort of orbiting planet rad my whole life and now I, I, I'm landing the ship and I'm able to walk on the ground. Mm -hmm. But so it's just a different like perspective. But you know and you know my mom, my mom you know she one of the movies she was in in her early in her career was Rocky. And that's an underdog story. That's a competition story. It's a sporting story. And there are similarities to like Rocky and Rad in ways. It's, you know, yeah. getting a chance to go the distance with like the the real established people in that world, right. a no name and underdog story. So it is that it's the Rocky and Wheels kind of thing. And it's cool that she also was a part of all those kinds of movies and was able to kind of bring her creative self and her business sense to that film as well. But, um, Anyway, it's a, I'm giving you lots of answers in one, but yeah, no, but that's it's yeah. it's really wild that your connection to it is is familial and emotional and and tied in with with family history and nostalgia, um, and and then I'm curious as you because uh, you were so instrumental in the the uh, uh, re-release and. Uh, remastering i guess or the, yeah the renovation yeah i could talk to you about that too it's technical but it's cool to talk about yeah well i'd love to hear a little bit about that process but also um in as you experience the narrative of the of the film and the world of the film not have like with you know not having a, a reference point like mine um and being like you know being deep into the bmx world uh like, how did you experience the narrative of the yeah. movie? And was yeah. it fun? Was it, did it have the same resonance that it's had for people like us? It's different in that BMX, what you experience in its day um, was, was very, was different. I think at, at every, at a time in someone's life when BMX was a thing and getting their first bike or their first, you know, go at that. I, I didn't have that experience. I mean, there were BMX bikes in my home from Rad or from that world that we, we had here. By the way, we have the crew helmet and the and the Bart helmet, so it's pretty cool <laughs> to have those helmets. But um, you know, my my experience with this film and with the BMX culture is through Rad. Rad was the sort of gateway to the world of BMX. Um, it wasn't like BMX was a thing and then oh my God, someone's making a movie about it. But um, I do, you know, 
when you go back in time and all the memories we have are triggered by our like senses, things we saw, smelled, heard. But I think mine is also like very much musical. Like my life has been music for so long, but rad, when I think of rad, I, I think of music too, because the soundtrack, for example, is so iconic, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously eighties had a certain, eighties was a certain, there was a look, fashion was a certain thing, bands were a certain thing. Just the way we discovered things was a certain kind of process that I I, I was much younger than you, maybe you guys were able to kind of feel and can go back to that place in your in your life. But when I think of Rad, I think of like Break the Ice and Thunder in Your Heart and all these those like great uh, those epic songs that are just like that I I still drive around like screaming to like Thunder in Your Heart and feeling goosebumps on my back when I hear those songs. But I don't know, like it wasn't at its it wasn't a commercial hit, maybe in the way that all other producers had intended when they, or the, the financiers had intended in the day, but in some weird magical way, it, it landed where it landed and it has a life of its own that I think you can't, you can't really ever bank on or no one could ever kind of write that story. And it's just like, that's just an amazing thing, actually. I, the fact that people are so emotionally affected by or find rad really hit them at a time and place that will always be be there for them like that's an that's an amazing thing there are movies that were commercial hits in their day that people have completely forgotten about probably but the one you know it is an underdog movie about an underdog story you know mm -hmm. so there are layers of it that are really relevant to the story that was told on screen but yeah i, I don't know i think if um you know, if, if I think the people that were involved in this movie, Bill, Bart, Sam, Robert Levy, all these different people involved, I'm sure this movie played out in a way even beyond maybe what they expected back in the day. Maybe they thought it was gonna come and go and no one would ever find it again. But it, it, you know, for whatever reason, the scarcity, it not being available for so long probably helped mm. keep it out there, you know, where yeah. it made it coming back even more special and unique. But yeah, so anyway, I, I don't know if it's just like, there's probably many, many, many explanations of why do people care still about this movie? It's like, it was the time in their life when it came out, it's the subject matter, it's the story that never gets old, the underdog story. And then it's maybe the fact that it just like wasn't available forever. And it was only yeah. a VHS tape on eBay for like a way overpriced, you know, purchase. Um, anyway, so I'm, again, I'm over speaking, but. You know, it's yeah. funny when we see these re-releases, Ed, people come and they pack these theaters. All right, let's go. No. Bill, how did you get roped in? What do you remember about that first, your first kind of uh, interaction with Rad? Uh, well, it was a simple audition. Hal had seen me on a TV show the night before he started casting. So he brought me in. I sat on a mongoose, read one scene, if that, and I fit the bike. I'm a mm -hmm. smallish guy, and I could play a 17-year-old, and I guess some of the other uh, young actors that were up for the role at the time, I don't remember Danny Jr. I'm sorry. Uh, they, they, uh, he just, I just clicked with Hal. I just want to say that. We're, yeah. we're Southern boys, and we recognize that, that, that kind of demeanor, and I think I got the job not because of my amazing acting chops, all right, but because I was that person at that time. I, I think you'd agree that casting often comes down to just happenstance and just being the right person at that time. And these are fleeting moments. You know, I can only play 17 for so long, but I was still 24 at the time. So I had the maturity to kind of work with these actors like Robert's mom and, uh, you know, Jack Weston and Ray Walston. They brought real actors to, to play those sure. roles. The other thing, it wasn't the, the supporting uh, actors were tremendous and you can't, that's kind of the next factor. So it's easy on lower budget movies to just worry about the lead or the second lead when if you have a really great supporting group, it, it feels like life, which is what we're trying to portray. Did you have to ride a bike in the audition? Did he make you- No, like, no, he it, was, it was funny. He, he was so heavy in the stunt doubles, he wasn't worried about me being able to ride a bike. He never asked, could I ride a bike? 
Uh-huh. He just knew he had me covered 12 ways from Sunday. And I do remember, you know, I do the iconic backflip. Well, they had built like a rotisserie for me to, to do a backflip so they could go in close. You know, so that's how that's how inside they were and how little yeah. I actually needed to know. And now I look at the scenes where I'm actually writing and it's very, very embarrassing. You know, for guys like you to know what they're looking at is like, how could he win hell track and not even do a, a bunny hop on a curb? You know, it's right. just like, you know, it doesn't all make sense, but it's such a feel good movie. Even experts like yourself just just go with it. It's yeah, like, you oh, just go with it. Yeah, that, you know, that's movie you know, magic. Yeah, he learned to win hell track because of a paper route. Well, yeah, probably not, but it works. Somehow. Well, speaking of close ups, uh, you know, just to, to, you know, Hal Needham, the director, just kind of knowing how to shoot you in a way that it doesn't really matter if you're a good BMX bike rider. Um, Bart, when you shot the movie, didn't didn't you have, weren't you have some crazy injury or something? Yeah, and this is typical for Hal because um, my introduction to him was he was going cross country from a NASCAR event because he was big time in the NASCAR at the time. And he had seen me in the Olympics and, and probably thought I, you know, I, the blonde headed kind of guy would be a, you know, a kind of a, an offshoot of the, you know, karate kid jerk, you know, and maybe sure. that's the guy for, for that role. And they're also a big, big stunt in the movie was a backflip, which I know something about, but I didn't ride BMX. I was like, Bill, I didn't really ride it. And um, so he came to town, I live in Oklahoma, and he said, pick me up at the airport. So I pick him up at the airport and I had gotten a script from an agent and I read some lines and I thought, I'll be ready. Well, I, I was into sports cars at the time, and so we drove around about 30 minutes in my turbo Porsche, and he was a car guy. And um, he said, you can just run me back to the airport. And I said, well, are we going to sit down somewhere and have a coffee and do some lines? He goes, no, 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 you're in my movie. <laughs> and then about, I was still doing gymnastics touring shows and stuff. So uh, right about three or four weeks before we started shooting up in Canada, I was doing a gymnastics exhibition and I totally blew out my knee. I mean, literally my leg was dislocated at a 45 degree angle. Um, so I had this massive surgery, complete reconstruction and everything. And I called Hal and I said, you know, I, I don't think I could be in this movie. I mean, I'm like, I'm gonna be on crutches for like 10 weeks. He goes, oh, you'll be all right. We'll give you some Percodan, you'll be fine. Oh my God. I, he did. And you know, of course he's an old school stunt man, which yeah. that's how they pretty much got through everything. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, wow! And I, like you said, you shot around it, so pretty much everything you see it for me is waist up because uh -huh. I, I my leg was bent literally in an immobilizer, and he shot all the way around that and figured out a way to make it make it look believable. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm grateful. You know, the thing about it was he he needed the movie to be outrageous, and that's typical for Hal, right, guys? I mean, if if it was just a race, okay, fine. But because Hal was a crazy stunt man and well known for it, and I think another thing why it resonated with because it was outrageous. I mean, dropping in at Hell Track, you know, people to this day say, "Man, what was it like dropping in Hell Track?" I mean, oh, it was undescribable because I've actually never done it. <laughs> <laughs> Literally undescribable. <laughs> oh man. So anyway, I, I just I was so thrilled to be a part of it. But I think part of the attraction was it was outrageous. It wasn't yeah. just like a race. So I I have a funny story about how Rad was re-injected into my life. Yeah. Um, I was uh, on the set of The Hangover. We were shooting a scene where um, uh, where uh, Bradley's we, so we we like commandeered a cop car and and Bradley's we're stuck in traffic sidewalk and we're driving this cop car down the sidewalk in Las Vegas. And there's all these pedestrians diving out of the way. And um, and so we're shooting this sequence. And uh, someone says, hey, you know one of the stunt guys that's jumping out of the way of the car? Uh, that's uh, one of the guys, um, he's like a BMX legend. And I know you were into BMX. I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> and I went over and I, I recognized him immediately. And it was Eddie Fiola, and, uh, who, who was... Bill, he was your stunt double for the movie and uh, went on to become a, a conventional stuntman and uh, was working on The Hangover. And I had this great, 
great sort of like Michael Jordan moment of like, you're in, you oh my God. And here I am, the star of this movie, like completely starstruck by a stuntman on the set of the movie. Awesome. And uh, we just had such a big laugh about that. And I've since like stayed in touch with Eddie and I just, I'm, I'm such a fan of him both as a, a BMX legend and as a human being. Um, but uh, I, I, it, it, it leads me to wonder, Bart and Bill, what your experience was like working with the stunt teams on this movie. Hal, obviously the director had uh, an incredible stunt background. I think he even started as a stunt man, then a stunt coordinator, and then a, a director. Um, so, uh, so the stunts were such a huge part of this movie. Uh, what was your relationship with Eddie? What was your relationship to the stunt team? Um, and then uh, Bart, maybe you can speak a little bit about your stunt uh, double and experiences too. Yeah, it was really interesting because Hal was the most prolific and highest paid stunt man in Hollywood for a long time until he became a director. But on this movie, he didn't know from bikes. I don't know if he, he'd even ridden a bike. So he really had to depend on what were essentially kids to tell him what was possible and what was not possible. And essentially kind of helped shape the, the whole look and the scope of the film. Uh, mostly my interaction was with the other actors because that's what I did, you know, but when it was time for stunts, I'm off in the trailer and then it's like, oh, you know, it's time to, make out with Lori Loughlin, Bill, you know, I was that guy. <laughs> and happy to be that guy. But uh, yeah, I did very few of my stunts, maybe getting on the dumpster, you know, stuff that I had to be there for that wasn't particularly dangerous. Uh, but so they brought in all these riders who brought in all their gear, all their uh, vans and whatever. And he basically got that donated just as sponsors. So. The riders pretty much kept to themselves because they all knew each other from the states and and bart and i we didn't really know each other but uh, uh and and being around uh talia shire that was intimidating for a young actor jack weston i grew up watching him on twilight so ray walston my favorite martian so uh, i was i was watching my p's and q's i had already messed up on film sets before and i wasn't going to be that guy again so um, I didn't have time to learn any bike stunts. Had I learned any bike stunts, I wouldn't have had time to recuperate if I'd screwed myself up. So it wasn't until I was in my 50s and hung out with Martin Navarro down at Huntington Beach did I actually pick up some balance tricks and, and what have you. But, so you, uh, became, you became a BMX freestyler in your 50s? Bad idea. Just a bad idea. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Because I know a lot of freestylers in their 50s, just none that picked it up in their 50s. And All right. We, yeah, we don't bounce so good uh, at this age. But it got me into the mix, and I uh, got I got some, you know, a little respect from these guys for at least trying. Yeah. You know, because yeah. it's a lot harder than it looks. You know, it's ten times harder than, than it than it even appears to the layperson. And uh, yeah, I consider a lot of these guys my my very dear friends, uh, and I expect some of them to you know push me around the old folks' home. That's coming right up. So <laughs> built race tracks in the, our yard and built uh, all the ramps. We had quarter pipes and trick ramps and all this stuff, and it was a pretty serious little crew of, of BMX nerds on my street. And um, mm. and I love hearing that. I love hearing that because once somebody who's had a career like that, by the time they're 18, now they, they've been through something, right? They can take a hit and keep on going. It's amazing. So thank you. And there, there's that, that Beetle Rosecrans story is funny because there was a similar, remember we, on our, because our backyard track, we built a new jump and it was like over a ravine and everyone was like, uh, I don't know if like we, we built it, but I don't know if anybody can do it. And I was the youngest kid on the street. And there, and I, I was just like, maybe I'll finally get some respect if I can do this. <laughs> and so I got the helmet on, everyone gathered around, they're like, go, go, go. And I make, and jumped over and I literally like heard, get ready to break the ice in my, <laughs> in, you know, in my head as I'm like in midair. <laughs> and I made it and everyone's like, <laughs> and it just was, uh, it was my rad moment. That was my oh, rad. And, and as the youngest kid to like be the first on that jump was wow. 
Very it's right. a real connection with a young man like you, you know, going for it. And, and, and here's my moment to be a hero. And we all look for moments like that in our lives or in our children's lives. You know, how do you create something like that? But uh, that's a thing that still blows me away is that someone like you, Ed, this somehow really impacted you at a really sort of crucial time as a young man, and it stayed with you. And I did just think that's beautiful. And you know, you can look at the movie from all different angles, and, and you know, the kitschiness of it, and and uh, the campiness of it, and all. But when you're like that age, boy, and you're seeing some cool stuff, and you hear a couple of bad words said, and you see some hot girls, I mean, it's just the best. And you see outrageous stunts. I mean, all of that connects with exactly the demographic as you were talking about, Ed. You know, and by the way, just to add, to, to sort of do a version of an answer for, to this question, um, I remember, well, it, first of all, it was pretty cool to read, to color time the movie and do the color grade of this new Lee Scan version of it. Because there was like, there was a version in storage of the, a negative of the film that had never been scanned ever. Wow. Like never run through a machine. So that's what we scanned with this 4K restoration that, that was just that everyone who's watching just watched it. Cool. Because we're, we're in the theater with you right now. But um, anyway, like pretty lucky to be able to have like the elements from the film in, in preserved in such a, a, a way that was helpful to this process. And Photochem, I will shout out Photochem because they're one of the last like labs in the country and they were very generous with their time, but they, you know, you dust bust the film, you, you paint, we, we did a whole like just session of watching it, making, you know, marking anytime you see a little piece of dust or a scratch or something and they cleaned it up. And we, there was no, there was no 5.1 mix for the film. It was a really thin sounding like left, right mix. So we were able to take the stems and recreate a 5.1. There was never a 5.1 theatrically. It was a, it was a stereo, which wow. is, stereo is fine, but it was really great to kind of play around with these, the audio stems and create a new experience for the yeah. viewer. But again, like very, like an interesting just experience growing up with Rad in our house, not really knowing ever in the future I would be able to help put it together and get it out there again in, in this kind of way. So really, anyway, just a great journey so far to be part of this. I will say March 21st is the official rad day now. So mark your calendars every year. It's rad day, March 21st. That's one where this movie is now, it's in theaters now, because again, you're watching this now in a theater. But yeah, March 21st, rad day. So we'd love to do something special for the film every, you know, every March 21st as we celebrate rad. Um, but to answer your question a little bit about like the sort of the resonance or the you know this you know the the waves we're all picking up on every year on this film i i got to screen the film the newly restored version for some like family members and friends and the next day like their parents sent me videos of their kids making ramps in their backyard mm. riding off ramps and like so i don't know it's just interesting that no matter the generation, no matter where we are, what time, hopefully we this movie affects people in a way where they want to make a ramp in their backyard and get on a bike and try something and find themselves in that kind of way. Yeah. Well, anyway, just something kind of, just like great great songs, you know, will always live on and, and, and you'll drive home with a love song and it'll, it'll mean something to you in that moment. This movie will mean something to somebody it's at some point in their lives if they're able to give it a, to watch it and be a part of it, so. Anyway, I find that to be really just thrilling and meaningful to see that it has the same effect no matter what generation is watching it, a similar take home effect, so. Well said, very well said. And I think a nice note to end it on. Guys, thanks so much for circling up to, uh, to have this chat. This was a ton of fun. Thank you, Ed. You're great. Thank you Appreciate it, Ed. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Yeah.